welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. Today, we are speaking to somebody who has gone into the lion's den. Louis Gomertz, District 1 in Texas, a decidedly red district. But you know what we've said over at Politics Done Right? It does not happen until it does. And you have to be brave to go in there and say, I am going to convince all these folks that for all these years been lied to, been promised things, and have gotten nothing. But because of who some claim they are, they simply continue to win. So Jamar Jefferson's going to change that. Jamar Jefferson wants to change that. Welcome to Politics on Right, Jamar Jefferson. How are you doing this morning? You know, it's just a blessing to be here, be alive. I get this opportunity to be as above, so below, to do as thy will. So my will is to try to make it better for not just East Texas, but all of us. Now, you are in District 1, Louis Gomert's district. Louis Gomert is not running anymore. Many of us know Louis Gomert as someone who was decidedly different. Now, uh, now. Why did you decide that you were going to attempt to win in Louis Gomer's district, which wasn't built for, to put it bluntly, for you? Well, the, the entire system wasn't built for us. Uh, so we'll start back so we know how to overcome because we're overcomers. Uh, you know, this is my 13th campaign. I've been out in California running against the system and I'm a proud Democrat, but we have a lot of problems in our own party with the division. Uh, we choose and pick the leaders that best suit special interests and the people are usually left out. So I got into politics because my father is one of the longest serving persons on death row in Texas history. His name is Delma Banks Jr. And in 2012, when the Supreme Court remanded his case back, I couldn't understand why my father had to take a plea deal because he was denied a new trial. So I ended up going back to school to be a teacher. And I never voted until I was 33, mm-hmm. 34. I'm 41 right now. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the last eight years, I've been in politics nonstop, just you know, indulging myself in losing and learning. And um, I've I've been going to everything. So um, my cousin died last year here in Dallas. He froze to death under the failed administration of Greg Abbott and uh, the failed leadership of Senator Ted Cruz not securing funding uh, to fix the power grid and their refusal to uh, plug in to a system that's more reliable than our own. Uh, He froze to death and they took him to the morgue instead of to the hospital. And it broke my heart because I'm a twin. And uh, my mom said, you should come back home because there's no one like you in Texas. And uh, you need to help the people where you grew up from. And I was like, no, mom, this is my third time running for Congress in California. I'm going to be Omni Bear. They just redistricted him and took him halfway out of his district. I'm ready. Jefferson for Congress. But when that happened, I looked at it. I said, this is a tough district to win. But as I looked at the numbers and I remember what happened in 1965 with Lyndon B. Johnson calling us the N word every time he took a breath. He said that if we let the Negroes vote, they'll be loyal to us for 100 years. Well, that 100 years has passed and we ain't got nothing but the same Democratic um, rhetoric as ever. Now, we have a lot of good Democrats. We have a lot of good Republicans. But what we're looking for is good Americans, because in 1965, or the, uh, the, in my opinion, the start of the political civil war happened because uh, we're in a civil war, in my opinion, between the Democrat and Republican Party, the two party system. They're fighting against each other for control and to control our budget. I came back and I said, you know, there's really more Democrats here because I looked at the history of our district and uh, Max Sanderlin, he had it for forever. And and a lot of people told me the only reason I had a woman named Nancy Nichols call me. She said, Jamal, if black people come out to vote you a win, you'll be the first black man to ever even run. And I was like, that's going to be hard. That's a hard sell. And I got a lot of uh, optimistic. I'm very optimistic and passionate and I'm a believer. But th- these it's tough. It's been tough. Um, uh, but I believe that I had a dream. Some said, listen, no guts, no glory. And are you the baddest Democrat in the land? Or are you not? I said, I am the baddest Democrat in the land. Well, go take the reddest district in the country. 
And I, I've been trying and we're, we're trying. <laughs> well, let me tell you, and I, and I think that, you know, that is the spirit. You have to go out there and talk to people. And I, I love something that you said. There are good Democrats and there are good Republicans. And I think in especially in this time of flux, um, Jamar, I think every single Texan in District 1 in East Texas will go into that booth and realize that the vote is between themselves, that computer or paper, whatever they vote on, and God. And their friends, peer pressure in, in, in politics has a lot to do with how people vote. And yes. I think uh, I think that uh, if you make that case respectfully, civilly, with every single East Texan, irrespective of ethnicity, irrespective of ideology, with respective of religion, I do think that uh, on November 8th, there can there could be a surprise for many, not only in East Texas, but not only in Texas, but nationally. And, and the, the thing about it is a passion that I see with which you speak to people. I got a call right after the Democratic Convention. And the first thing they said is there's this dude out there. His name is Jamar. Jefferson, you have got to get him on politics done right because he is going for Willie for for uh, Gomert's district, and not only that, but he's talking to everybody. So tell me a little bit about how you're engaging in your in your in your district. Well, uh, in this district, um, I took everything that I learned that I did wrong from the previous elections. And I'm here, no one knew me. I'm starting over. I'm a fresh candidate, but I'm an experienced candidate. Right. Uh, I've helped people win, but everybody used me as the grounds person. Hey, Jamar, go take a, go to a, deliver these 100,000 uh, uh, flyers to 100,000 homes. Yes, you're going to pay the people. I know they didn't pay me. I did this for love because I have grit. Right. Grit wins. Games grit wins election when you can't. People think it's impossible to win, but uh, personally, I possibly turned, uh, maybe talked to over fifty thousand people myself. I'm in my minivan. I ran into Beto at least at about fifteen different events, mm -hmm. right? Um, since I filed in uh, 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 November, we've been nonstop uh, in the minivan. I've been through my district seven times. Uh, it's over fifteen hundred miles. It's I know it, it includes Nacogdoches and Angelina. I mean, it's it's amazing. No, no they move uh, when they when they did the illegal redistricting, right? Uh -huh. to our vote in and to defraud the census of represent proportional representation. Right. Per, uh, they moved Nacogdoches and Lufkin out and put Texture County in. So I thought when I came back, I'll be running against Pat Fallon. Oh. Right? He was picked out of a straw, right? They right. literally picked him out of a straw because I admire what the Republicans do. They don't battle each other like that. Right. All the owners, they get behind one person. And if any other Republican want to jump in, you're on your own. We're going to see if you a uh, you can take out Goliath, David. And uh, so uh, essentially just talking to people, my message out in California, one of my mentors was the former Republican chair of Sacramento, because a lot of people wouldn't accept me because when I saw what the Democrats were doing wrong out there, you with called all the it out. I called it out when I saw people sleeping up on the bridges and I went to a city a council meeting nonstop. I say, listen, this is an easy fix. You have a one point one billion dollar budget. You have, according to your own records, you have over 19,000 vacant lots. We can refurbish. We have what, 5,000 homeless list. Let's, let's refurbish twenty five hundred of them, um, five thousand of them, turn them to duplexes. I mean, twenty five hundred, turn them into duplexes and we can get people off the streets. We can eliminate panhandling by putting up posters saying do not invest into the war on drugs by giving money to the people who are put out on the corners by the drug dealers. Why? Just give it to the city, put it inside. We, we could have got rid of the parking meters and tell people to make your donation there. And that way we could have opened up 
up what I'm saying, feed the people programs to where the city should be buying restaurants so that any American who is hungry can go in with dignity and get a meal three times a day. There's a better way to do this, but we're not doing politics rights because special interests have hijacked the system the same way they came and stole this land. So it's a mentality. No, it's funny that you use the word that they are not doing politics right because now you are on the program called Politics Done Right. Okay. So in, interestingly, uh, Jamari, what is very important here is um, there are a lot of specifics within your district that I find uh, I, I am very concerned that even Democrats that have run before, even your opponent, never actually used. And I have a question to ask you about them using it. Example, right now in the in the entire East Texas, uh, hospitalization, having, uh, having hospitals that people can go to, some of them are closing, some of them are on reduced tasks for one specific reason. And that is because uh, the, the Texas delegation, most, mostly comprised of Republicans, have not done anything, and the Texas legislature have not done anything to take the money that Texans are already contributing to the Medicare and Medicaid expansion to the Affordable Care Act. They are still not taking their share out of that pocket simply because they don't want to claim they're using the, 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 uh, the Affordable Care Act just because. Are you letting your constituency know that their representatives, both federally and state, are getting them killed? And that getting them killed has nothing to do with being black or white. It simply has to do with them getting a hell of a lot of green. Well, well, it, it boils down to this. It's a pride and ego thing. It's not about public service as the highest form of representation for anyone in East Texas. I tell people all the time, we need Beto and we need Greg Abbott out, right? He's a bad leader. He's bad for Texas. Louis Gomer, he was bad for East Texas. And my opponent, Nathaniel Moran, he's bad for East Texas. He's a special interest. Give a prime example. He led the charge uh, to sue the pharmaceutical companies and they got over a billion dollars. And that money is not working, it's trickling down to help the people who were most uh, affected by it. So as a member of Congress, when we win, because they just did a report, said he might be able to beat the expectations because we're looking at the margins. So it is possible that even though everyone has written off this race, they forgot that I am JJ. I right. don't play. Well, one of the things we can do to counter to to counter ignorance or selfishness, because that's what we're dealing with, selfish, indulged leaders. I have a bill that I want to introduce called HELA, the Healthcare Investment Literacy Act, where we invest in the literacy of our healthcare to have a healthier and stronger America. Being that many rural areas, such as Red River County, a hospital that has been worked, been abandoned for over eight years, we have places in Dangerfield, Mount Pleasant where people have to drive 30 minutes to an hour to get health care when they need it. We need to put inside the budget as a representative to where we can go straight directly to the providers and bypass the states, right? Why? Because these people are paying their taxes or we are the collateral for our loan and that loan money is not being allocated correctly. So uh, the things that I can do, number one, hand everybody in uh, uh, Congress a constitution and then when they I see them breaking it, we sue them and I go to the sergeant of arms. See, a lot of the stuff, uh, the reason it's allowed to happen because most people in Congress are lawyers and their first duty is to the bar and the court, not to the people. So if you know this and you know the, the language of allegiance of most people in Congress is not to the American people, it's to the bar association and then it's to the integrity to protect the court. Well, you can counter that with a tight title 1982. You can do writ of mandamus, writs. And once you start talking uh, uh, a legal language to these individuals, they straighten up real fast because uh, a, a, a lawyer is nothing but an independent contract. Right. right? 
he's personally responsible for their duty. Plus, uh, it's in the Constitution that um, uh, uh, bribery is illegal. So there's things that we can do to make sure that people get access to health care in East Texas. Like one of the things inside HELA I want to do, we have 100,000 veterans that live in my district. And I say our district, but I want to be the representative. And we need... Um, we need a um, a facility for our veterans. We need a a um, oh my goodness, it just went blank on me. <laughs> well, the veterans, you're, you're, yeah. you wanted to build for the veterans. Yeah. We need a VA here in East Texas so people don't have to travel to a VA hospital, so they don't have to travel to Shreveport to Dallas. Uh, we need to also make sure we can have voucher programs so that our veterans can pick their own provider. Because once again, we're dealing with special interests. Uh, most people don't know how the government actually works. That's the most shocking thing. We get a budget and Congress makes laws. And we and for, uh, allocate uh, budgets, create the budgets to allocate it. So I want to make sure that I have my big bucket when the budget is passed. Uh, we supposed to get some of this. We want some money from here and we want some money from here. And I think with good leadership, I sing a song called This Little Light of Mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And when other members of Congress who are afraid because the big fish, such as Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy, they get to eat first. No, I'm going to be a piranha right there. Give me that. Because East Texas needs someone who gives a, who cares about them. Because I was one of those children that they didn't give a damn about. And I want to make sure that that stops because poverty creates crime. Absolutely. So, and I, I, I trust that you're going through your entire community, uh, the every single corner of your community to 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 not only introduce yourself but, but to tell folks this is what J uh, Jamar Jefferson is going to do when Jamar Jefferson gets into office. Uh, absolutely, we're we're excited about talking. I've, people are saying that I've talked to more people than other candidates combined. Um, right now, we're going through a hundred cities. We got JJ's driving through East Texas. Oh yeah! So we're setting it up right now. Starting on, um, we had to post it back. We had to push everything back to give me a couple of days because I had a hate crime happen to me, and it affected me. But you know, I'm not gonna lay hate. Stop. Stop. What? What? Please let me know what happened. So as we was doing our drive, we had an event in Longview. It was great. We had to be in Carthage at six o'clock. So we were gassing up at 12 o'clock in Longview, Texas to go to Carthage. And um, um, uh, as I was at the Sam's Club, which I'm a member of, uh, have been for a while, um, I was getting gas and my card would not work. So I was sliding my card and I went and knocked on the door of the gas person attendant. And I said, hey, my car is not working. Could you give me a courtesy slide? Because they do that. And they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, I know you. You JJ? I said, I said, yeah. He said, man, how do I register to vote? I want to vote for you, man. I'm excited. You know, I've been seeing your signs up everywhere. I said, well, what are your concerns? And we're walking to the gas pump. So while he's doing this, there's a, 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 a fellow American who has to be a European descent, uh, um, 65 plus older. He's just looking at me like this. Uh-huh. Right. So I'm I'm a nice person. I nodded at him and I said, well, how you doing, sir? And he did like this. And I just left it alone. And so the young man said, how can I vote? I said, well, we got an event. Let me get your number. And I reached in to get. Um, two of these. Right. These, these are my pieces, my record pieces that I'm sure. Pushing. JJ. So I, I I I went and I said, here you go. And I just gestured to the guy, hey, this is this young man is trying to unite us. Now it says on the front, Democrats, Republicans, Independent, United for a Better America. There you go. Yeah. So that's my message. Always have been. He said, Can I say the words or you want me to believe it out? He said, I don't want the S H I T. No, no, you can't say the words. I don't want that. You people, what's wrong with this country? Y'all messing it up. I said, what do I do? I'm just trying to make it better. He said, yeah. He kept start cussing me out, saying all kinds of negative things. So me, I got thick skin. I turned to the young American who happened to be Asian, looked like he's 21. And I said, you know, I'm so glad as we move forward, we're going to forget the past. 
Remember, but we're going to focus on fixing problems and moving together. Then he reached in. He said, you're right. So he embraced me and gave me a hug. And then that guy said, I looked over. He said, you full of air. And he was going back to get his gas. So while I was embracing the young man, I just happened to look over. And I saw somebody act like that. He with his pump, like he wanted to throw down gas on me. So I said, you better not throw that gas on me. You better not. I raised my tone because and then he, 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 he stopped. He stopped going towards hit the gas pump to put it back up. And he looked at me and he said, I ought to hold you down and set you on fire. And I froze. Right. I ain't never had anybody say they're going to set me on fire. Wow. I looked down the barrel of that gas pump. I said, oh, he finna set me. He finna dash me with this gas. Because people don't know, I've been in a bad car wreck before where I should be dead. And I saw my life flash before my eyes. So that that feeling and emotion came back up. And, and I believed him. And then immediately I prayed in my head because I'm Semitic and I believe in the creator. And um, uh, yeah, I said, yeah, what shall I do? And I said, you better not do that. There's no forgiveness for the wicked. If you dash me with that gas, you will go to the lake of fire and you will burn with brimstone. And there's no forgiveness. How can you do this to an American? And then he snapped out. He's like he was in a trance of hate. And he snapped out and he did like this. And he looked at what he was doing. And then he went and put it up. And, I, and then I was shocked. I was like left in stage of shock. And I turned to the young man. He said, wow. I said, you heard of that? He said, yes. And all of a sudden, I looked to my left. I had my campaign manager behind me in her car. And it was a young, a older African-American lady uh, in a red um, uh, uh, Cadillac. And she was like telling me to come here. So I moved through. I'm, I'm in shock the whole time. I said, ma'am, I'm finna have her to move. She said, no, I don't have my card. My card, could you help me? I said, yeah, I got you. So I went and got my wallet, got my card, came and paid for her gas, pumped her gas for her, and I went back. It was $37. She had $40 in her hand. I said, let me go get you some change. So I went and got my wallet, Got her, gave her $4. She gave me the 40 bucks. You know, I'm just a good Samaritan. I look for opportunities to help people. But I went and got in my car and I was shocked. And I was a little emotional because I was like, wow, I believe he was going to burn me alive. Because, you know, I froze. I didn't want to have my phone or anything. I don't want to reach for anything at that moment because he could have probably thought I was reaching for a weapon and he could have, you know, shot me down, reached for his gun. This is an open and carry state and people use fear. I do got the complexion to get away. So I just, you know, hey, you know, I'm like this. I'm froze. So I was in the car and I stood there for like five minutes and I was like, wow, that man really wanted to kill me. So I called my twin brother and I said, bro, do you know what just happened to me? He said, what? I'm driving off sounds. I didn't want to say nothing at first. And I said, you know, this guy said he threatened to hose me down with gas and set me on fire. He said, "Uh uh-uh, you still there? I said, no. He said, go back, because if you did that to anybody, you're going to be in jail and you're going to prison. So I turned around. I called a few more people. Uh, my consulting company that I'm working with. And I called a, a supporter of mine, Miss Mary Lou. She said, Jamar, someone pulled a gun on me and this is going too far. And if you don't stand up, who will? And if not now, then when? And so I, I saw, I saw, you know, counsel from the people that, that I, I love and have respect for and uh, people that's on my team. So when I went back to uh, call the police, the police came out there and he gave me no respect. Uh, he didn't take it serious. He said he don't believe that a gas pump is a weapon. I said, well, if I turn that gas active gas pump on you, you have every right to shoot me down. He said, no, it has to be justified. I said, so you don't think that's a weapon? No. He said he ought to do it. I said he ought to do it. It don't matter if he said ought to. Did he spray you? I said, the man threatened my life. And if we don't make an example of him now, he's going to go hurt somebody. Just like that young killer in Uvalde, they knew ahead of time that they called him a school shooter, right? We It's called foreseeable negligence. And right now, the state of Texas should be sued for not invoking the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia necessary for the security of a free state and the right of the people to bear arms. It never says the right of the individuals. And those people must secure the state. And how can we have security if the militia 
doesn't exist. It's a free for all here. And we need the governor, Craig Abbott. He has failed in his fiduciary duty to regulate a militia. So I was fearful that this unregulated person could have just shot me down. And I'm here for a mission to to I, I'm not trying to be a martyr. I'm not trying to be a martyr, especially with the disrespect that I'm having in my own district. I'm the first. When you're the first, you really get it, right? I'm the first um, uh, African-American, even though it says Negro on my birth certificate. right? <laughs> so I say that a few other Negro uh, Americans, they don't like to have, but um, who, who, but it, I, I'm, I'm, it's a split. It's a big war going on in East Texas because most of the Republican Party is full of former Democrats. Right. 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 And, and they literally I have Democrats who work for Republicans. Um, uh, it, they tell me I can't really help you because I might lose my job. My boss is very conservative. And, you know, I've been getting all kinds of harassment. I'll chop your signs down. And who do you think you is? And people brash weapons, people. But this cut the cake. I've never had it like this where it affect me. I've looked down a barrel of a gun. I mean, I, you know, get out the way, right? Get out of the line of fire. But you can't get out of line of somebody talking about hosing you down. Shit go everywhere. And he said his intention was to set me on fire. So that affected me. I was emotional for like at least, I mean, this happened last week. It took me like three, four days to get over this. Because so, it, is, it is absolutely serious, my friend. I, look, I am glad that you recounted that story because that story on its own uh, is, is intense. But let me tell you, uh, for every bad person you run into, and I'm sure since you speak to so many people, there are so many good people. And just like we don't want um, a, the reflection of one bad person to to actually be representative of us all, we can't let that the reflection of those bad folks to change that positive energy that you are putting out there, that positive energy, because the positive energy is what's going to make you win. The positive energy is what's going to let people see he has overcome what, what they've thrown at him with dignity, perseverance, and character. Last question I always ask is, tell me something you wish I had asked you that I didn't. Ask me, why am I doing this? Mr. Jamar Jefferson, why are you running uh, for Congress in District 1, a district once controlled by Louis Gohmert, and we know who he is. Well, my father, once again, he's in prison. I actually found out who the killer was, and they knew about it. And when I was a child, no one came to my high school, you know, and told me to register to vote. Nobody told me that you can be anything. You're going to be just like your father, you know, a murderer in prison. And when my father took that plea deal, it broke me. It really bothered me. Like me coming back when my cousin died here in Texas and they took him to the morgue instead of to the hospital to, cause he froze to death, right? Asphyxiation, I believe is what it is. But I came back home because I left to figure out how to come back home to become somebody like in that movie, Leonidas, when he, he left as a boy, when he came back to Spartan King, hell to the King 300. Woo, woo, you know what they did in the movie. Right. So I feel like that moment coming here, overcoming all the obstacles, even though he sac sacrificed himself for the people, uh, which I'm more than willing to do. I just want to make sure that the future is for all of us, not just some of us. It's a saying that 85% of the people are followers, 10% are creators or um, creators or and 5% are observers. I just happen to be all three. I'm a follower, I'm a creator, and I'm an observer. But the 10% get mad at the 5%, which I'm in, and because they feel like we're going to mess it up for them. I tell people sustainability is what George Washington was talking about. The virtue of America is the economy. And if we can't keep the economy that works for all of us and it creates poverty, we create jobs for a few of us, sort of like the police department. 
uh, the war on drugs, the border patrol. These are the things that's trying to, we can't, st- we focus more on the outside instead of the inside. The drugs are coming through the air and under the under the ground. And it's affecting the community because the community are seeking drugs because they're miserable because the one thing, I don't know what people need, but I know what we're not getting. And that's opportunities and the opportunities to first some, let someone know that we care about you. So I'm running most of all, just to let people know that I care about you and people know how much you care about how much you're willing to sacrifice regardless of the outcome. So I'm running for Congress because there was no one in my life ever, including Barack Obama. I mean, he was a great president, but the Affordable Care Act, I'm in the middle, right? So there was nothing that directly benefited my generation. So if you're 45 to 25, I mean, we have to build for the future because right now Social Security will be insolvent in, in, in the 2030s. Uh, before 2040. And there will be nothing left from us. Most of the older people right now who do own the properties, who have sold them now to foreigners, we have to rent the American dream. That's the reason we need home ownership programs to where people my age can have the dignity of owning or at least subconsciously thinking you own because we own nothing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or at least have a stability. I'm huge on stability. Our children feel safe. We should have resources following our children home so that, that if they are in um, a marginalized community, that we can send resources home because poor people pay more taxes than rich people. This is proven, right? Because rich people, they go to the state of Delaware and they operate in a trust. And, and it's three different Americas. It's, it's the, the, the trust people operate, the corporate people, and it's the rest of us, the tax slaves, um, the obligees. And uh, so essentially, I just want to make sure that I do my part to build that bridge to the future so we can make it better. Jamar Jefferson candidate, Democratic candidate for District 1 to replace Louis Gohmert. Uh, I think you are an impressive young man, and I wish you all the luck. And I tell you what, um, bring bring it home to the people. Bring it home for your entire district. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. Can I, is, I know this may be a shameful plug, but can I say this? Uh, I would like for everybody to follow me. Uh, go to my website on jeffersonforcongress.com. Uh, it has been very difficult trying to get other congressional candidates to support candidates, even those that are in winning seats like Jasmine Crockett, Mark Vesey, Sheila Jackson Lee. And we've, we've only raised about $21,000. I had to invest a lot of my own money. I gave my last 65000 that I have because I believe in this. And we need to raise funds because I believe we can win this race. So if people can go hit that act blue at jeffersonforcongress.com, or if you would like to mail a check at 510 East Loop, 281 Sweet B 746 Longview, Texas 75605. All donations are appreciated. Uh, the max that you can give is $2,900 or at least send $5. I'm appreciative because a mailer costs 62 cents and we are targeting 150,000 homes. We need about two, we need to break record numbers and we can do this if with your help. We're going to win, but we're going to win. And last minute. So the help is going to come at the end. We're building a a, a historic campaign here to set us up for the future uh, so that we can get common sense people with common sense back in leadership. So thank you so much. (laughs) Jamar Jefferson, from your mouth to America. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. Thank you so much. Y'all favor you all. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.